the Grand Hotel. After the hotel had been bombed, the ministers appeared on TV. In the days before, we had seen them stabbing the air with their fingers as they threatened strikers. Even as they claimed to be creating new jobs, the number of jobless rose to a record. With arguments unchanged since they won the School Debating Society Cup, they demanded that workers obey the laws they passed to protect their own power. The malice of these collar and tie thugs set the conference audience squealing and stamping. This was the ruling class in the Indian summer of power. We wondered how such people could rule. Perhaps it is all a matter of arrogance. The vehemence with which the young public school Nazi on the podium calls the striker's leader a thug. And now they have been bombed. We saw the hotel's gleaming facade, a giant billboard smile with a smoking cavity. The minister's face stuck from the rubble. No doubt this was pain, but the sneer was so habitual no change could be noticed. Yet suddenly they are human. They have problems. Today their eyes stare like those of a woman who thinks of her unpaid rent. Their faces are as blank as the unemployed's leaving the job center. Their shoulders, as tense as the mother's whose son is on active service in the wars of the little islands. For once, they do not interrupt the interviewer, but wait, as humbly as the wife who sits in the long corridor of the Victorian hospital, while nurses fight to keep her husband alive on a support machine 20 years older than the metal press that crushed him. Tomorrow, their tongues cut from jackboots will rasp as they vote money to arm police now that they have another reason, and to close hospitals and schools and build prisons and military airstrips. But today, they sit as meekly as children with cut knees. Their suits smell of bomb dust, and they look at the TV interviewer as if they hoped he would give them a comforting pat on the wrist. These ministers who can appear human only after they have been bombed. Nothing else matters. Last night in Wall's End, the young people spoke with accents so thick I could not understand some of the lines I'd written. Yet the play had more to tell its audience than it had on the great city stages. They would have found the lies if I had not written truths they proved every day of their life. So that they told my truth with their strength. And out in the cold I said, right for them. Nothing else matters. But those whose lives create truth should also speak on the great city stages. <laughs>